Tell the person next to you, neighbor, don't bother me today. I need to hear from heaven. Amen. Amen. You could call me later with your stuff. Amen. We could talk on the phone. We could talk after church. I need to hear a word from the Lord. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. What a good name. James chapter 1. Four verses. The book of James. James chapter 1. You there? All right. If you need me to wait, say, wait a minute. Or if you need to look up on the board, say, let me look up on the board. Put the scripture. James chapter 1, the first four verses. James, a servant of God and of who? And of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers or different temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith does what, Salem? Worketh patience. So let, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, entire, and what else? And wanting nothing. Ask the person next to you, and this is the last time. You, you could tell them something when I tell you to tell them something. They just can't tell you nothing on their own. They just can't think of nothing on their own to tell you. Look at the person next to you and say, neighbor, can you survive basic training? Amen. Amen. Can you survive basic training? I want to talk from the subject surviving basic training. Surviving basic training. In all of the branches of military, all the branches across the spectrum of military, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, and the National Guard. In all branches of military, they all start out with an introductory period called boot camp or basic training. I want to salute everybody who's ever been in the service. Stan, if you've been in any branch of the service, everybody that's been in the branch of the service, hallelujah, amen. All right. Well, then that means at least I ought to have a few amen at the beginning. Amen. You don't just enlist and become a soldier the next day. That, that, that's not how it works. You don't just sign up and say, I want to be a soldier, and then they give you a uniform, and then they say, okay, now today you're a soldier. Am I right about it, military people? Everybody... And I mean everybody must go through a, at least a 16-week period called basic training. I wonder if I have a real church. In basic training, you are not just free to roam about the country. While you're in the basic training, you cannot do what you want to do when you want to do it. Do, do I have any help from the people who just stood? In basic training, somebody got a quick name, amen. Somebody had a Vietnam flashback. We got to check that person for weapons over there. Them non people be having Agent Orange and stuff like that. In basic training, every move is carefully scrutinized by a drill sergeant. You are told, and listen, Salem, basic training is some tough stuff. Amen. Now, I'm not going on personal experience. 
And you'll get a chance to see some of it on the board. But basic training is tough stuff. I wonder if I have a witness from anybody who know. Basic training is tough stuff. You are told when to get up out of the bed. You are told when to go to sleep. You are told uh, that you have to run several miles a day. Do I have the basic training video? Yes, it should be rolling right about now. All right. Not only do you have to run several miles a day, then you have to march. And I'm not talking about no justice, no peace. I ain't talking about we shall overcome. I ain't talking about Dr. King. Are you with me here? In basic training, you have to march. Not only do you have to march, but you have to learn how to break down a firearm. Huh? And not only do you learn to break down a firearm, but then you have to learn how to shoot the gun that you learn to break down. In the basic training, you learn survival skills in the wilderness. Are you with me here? You have to learn to climb a wall. You have to learn how to wade through the mud. You have to learn how to wade through deep water. You have to learn how to keep your head down while you are crawling underneath barbed wire. You know, you know, I saw you, brother, stand, and back in the day, y'all had hair. You can't lift your head up when you're crawling under barbed wire. Are you with me here? You carry a heavy duffel bag on your back, and you carry the duffel bags for miles. Basic training is tough. Somebody ask me why. Because all that is is to prepare you for the service. I wish I had some help here today. I wish I had somebody gonna catch that in a minute. I, I, I said it's all done, Spencer, to prepare you for service. It's all done to prepare you for life as a soldier. It's all done to prepare you for the military. Basic training is not designed to break you. Basic training is designed to make you. Did you hear what I said? It is not designed to tear you down. It's designed to build you up. Basic training is not designed to break you. It's designed to make you a soldier. Look at somebody and say, hello, soldier. Amen, amen. We sing these songs. We sing these songs. I don't even know if we know that we didn't join the army. We sing these songs. We are soldiers in the army. We have to fight. We, we sing these songs. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. We sing these songs. I'm a soldier. Well, hello, soldier. Come on, lean over and tell somebody else. Hello, soldier. If you are indeed a soldier in the Lord's army, I am here to tell you today that you must then understand basic training. 14% of all recruits, I don't care if it's the Army's recruit, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, the National Guard, 14% of all recruits never make it through basic training. Holy is the lamb. And they never make it, Marvin, because 14% of the recruits fail to understand the purpose of that training. There is a purpose, you know that, don't you? That training, basic training, that training is to prepare you for the obstacles and for the pitfalls and for the stuff that you're going to meet down the road that you don't even know you're going to meet. Huh? Basic training is to prepare you for some things that are going to come up 
as you prepare or as you become a soldier, but you don't know those things that can come up. Watch this now. But the drill sergeant knows. And so you must go through certain obstacles to prepare you for service. Is there anybody here that want to serve the Lord? Is there anybody? Is there anybody? Find a different neighbor and tell them, I want to serve the Lord. You say it that mighty weak. You say it that mighty low because you know what's coming. I want to serve the Lord. Well, if you want to serve the Lord, then the Lord has to get you ready to serve. You don't just walk down the aisle and become a Christian and then say, I I'm ready to serve. No, it's some training that goes along. The book of James is written by a fella by the name of James. Very good. You passed that test. I was a little worried. I was a little worried. I know somebody over there said Paul because he wrote most of the Bible. And anytime you say the book was written by you, if you just say Paul, you probably got it right. But the book of James was written by who? James. James. There are three prominent people in the New Testament by the name of James. There are two disciples named James. There is James, the son of Alphys. He's a disciple of Jesus, but we rarely hear about him. Uh, there is James, the brother of John. He, he's the one we hear about most. James and John, they are the sons of Zebedee. That, that's the second James in the New Testament that's prominent. And then there is James, the brother of our Lord. Jesus had a brother, and his brother's name was James. This New Testament book that we are studying was written by James, the brother of Jesus. Are you with me so far? This book of James is written by James, the brother of Jesus. Yes, I see some of you. I know you shocked. I know you thought Mary stayed a virgin. I know you, I know you thought that. I know that there are some people, even today, who pray this prayer. Holy Mary, uh, of her Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for me. You could pray that. You could say, Holy Mary, uh, pray for me, but you can't say virgin. Mary ain't no virgin no more. Are you with me here? You, this James is James, the brother of our Lord. Holy is the Lamb. During the lifetime of Jesus, his brothers and sisters were not believers. Did you hear what I said? During the lifetime of Jesus, don't, 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 don't fret now. Don't fret when you're inviting people to church and they don't come to church. Don't, don't give up because during the lifetime of Jesus, his own brothers and sisters wouldn't go to his church. But, but I also, what I also like about this, Carolyn, what I like about this is that it says it's not where you start. I came out to tell some of you all, stop beating yourself up because you just joined church last month. Stop beating yourself up because you ain't even in church. Some of you that are not in church yet, good news, you can become a member of the church today. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. Are, are you with me here? James was not on the road. James was not with Jesus at the beginning, but James is going to be there at the end. Uh, it's not until after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead that James becomes a follower of his brother. As a matter of fact, Jesus made a special appearance to James after he got up from the grave. Are we going to learn something this morning? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For those of you who are slow on the Bible verse draw. 
You can pick it up on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4. And that he was buried and that he rose again when? The third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then the twelve. And after that, he was seen above by how many? Five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are falling asleep. Read with me. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. All right? Jesus, when he was resurrected, appeared to James. Once James saw him, once he had a chance like Thomas to put his finger into the nail print on Jesus' hand, once he had a chance like Thomas to put his finger on the, the spear that went through Jesus' side, the record is that he became a believer. Are y'all with me here? Not only does James become a believer, but let me press further to tell you that he emerged as one of the leaders of the New Testament church. He became a leader. It's in Acts chapter 15. Read it when you go home. The church reaches a cross world road. Remember, the church was just born in Acts chapter 2. By the time we get to chapter 15, it's an infant church. It's a baby church. And so they're wrestling with the question whether or not they can let Gentiles in or not, or whether the Gentiles have to be circumcised. And there's a big controversy. It's James. In Acts chapter 15 that stands and, and reaches the verdict that just let God do what God's going to do. As a matter of fact, I might stop there and say we should just let God save who he's going to save. A, a, amen. Let God work the way God is going to work. And just because God works one way in some person's life or in your life, it doesn't mean he has to work the same way in our life that he worked in your life. Are you with me here? It's James. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. It is uh, Paul who calls James an apostle. Did you hear what I said? It, it, it's there. It's there. Read it. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. Y'all have it up on the board yet? It's going to come. It's going to come. It's going to be there. All right. But other of the apostles saw I none, you read, save James. Who is he? The Lord's brother. So Paul said that when he was first converted, he didn't see any of the other apostles, but he did see the apostle James, the Lord's brother. Are you with me here? It is then Salem James who identifies himself as the author of, of the book of James. Did anybody just learn something? Anybody, anybody, anybody? All right, go to work tomorrow bragging now. Go to work tomorrow and brag tomorrow. I bet you didn't know that James is written by the Lord's brother. James identifies himself in the opening verse. He says, here it goes. You ready? Let's start. James, a what? Servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. What's up? He said, greetings. Listen to how, listen to how, Marty, listen to how he introduces himself. Listen now, listen. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James, a slave. James, the one who has renounced his own freedom for the purpose of serving God and for the purpose of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not identify himself as James the Apostle. You know, Negroes love titles. You know that, don't you? 
You know that, don't you? And there's some people that if you get that title wrong, the right reverend, bishop, apostle, doctor, uh, your holiness, archbishop, uh, I can't keep up. I can't keep up. I just say, look, your mama calls you. Your, your, mama, your mama named you uh, George. I'm going to call you George. Your mama calls you George. I'm going to call you George. People get mad. He, 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 did not, he did not identify himself as an apostle. He did not say uh, James, the leader of the church. He, he is the leader. He was the leader of the church. He did not identify himself as James, the leader of the church. And, and, and he didn't do like we would have done. I would have done it. You would have done it. Uh, we might as well fess up. He didn't play. I hate to say this word. Ooh, I, oh, I hate to say this word. He did not play his trump card. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. We'll all get depressed. Let's move on. Let's move on. His trump card is he the brother Jesus. Don't you know that if I was right, y'all, I'd say this me, this Jesus brother. You don't even get it out right. You can't even say it correctly. It's Jesus, brother. Y'all, that, y'all better listen to me. I'll be the told my big brother, oh, y'all. All y'all going to hell. He said, this is James. I'm a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at how he treated his brother. He said he's Lord. I said he said he's he's Lord. I don't ever want you to forget that fact now. Don't be real comfortable with Jesus. Don't be around here with people using his initials talking about JC stop by. No, no, no. He's Lord. Will you tell somebody next to you he's Lord? Will you tell somebody else he's Lord? He is Lord. He is Lord. Will you worship him for a minute? He has from and he Lord. Say it with me. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess what are we going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord is Lord come on let's say it one more time let's honor him this morning come on he is Lord we love you master we love you we worship you he is Lord. The tomb is empty. The tomb's empty. He has risen from the dead. We worship you. And he is Lord. One day, whether you like it or not, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue every tongue is going to confess what? That Jesus Christ. Who is he? Let's go. He is Lord. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I might add that Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You see, if Jesus cannot be Lord of all, he ain't going to be Lord at all. That, that, that's who Jesus wants to be in your life. And he doesn't want to hurt you. He doesn't want to keep you from having fun. He wants to protect you. Are you with me here? 
Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Next, he tells us who he's writing to. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Are you still with me? The 12 tribes would be all of the Jews who had become Christians. You do know that that 12 tribes, that signifies Israel. And so there were many people who were Jews, who were practicing Judaism, who when Jesus came along and was resurrected from the dead, and James is one of them, they became Christians. And so James is letting us know that he's writing to all of the Jews who had become Christians. Um, I am sure that these people thought like we thought. I am sure that they thought that once, Reverend Stephen, you become a Christian, that things are going to go sort of smooth. Are you with me here? And, and, and you all, uh, be, be very careful now, you all. Be very careful because there is a myth out here. There's a myth out here that Christians are not supposed to go through stuff. There's a myth out here that we're not supposed to have hardships and trials and tribulations that all we have to do is name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and reach up and it's ours and all we have to do is speak. Trouble be gone and then trouble gonna be, no, no, no. There is some ups and downs. There is some twist and turns that go along with being a Christian. And if you think that it's more than one twist, then it's twists. When these believing Jews became believers, all hell broke loose. We think sometimes, who ever heard of suffering trials for your faith? But because they accepted Jesus as the Christ, and because they were now followers of Jesus Christ, let me walk through what happened to many of them. Many of them were separated from their family. Family said, that's it. If you're going to believe in that, if you're going to believe in that heresy, then you're not a part of our family. I, I started to say, I started to say, can you imagine if you just get cut off from your family? But half of us would be having a party. <laughs> All right. They ain't going to call me no more. They ain't going to call me no more. Hey, hey. <laughs> Y'all really mean it. Y'all really mean it. <laughs> Y'all really mean it? Not only that, but it's not a laughing matter when we discover that they were cut out of the family's will. And whatever fortunes the family had amassed, they were no longer a part of that fortune. Those who had jobs lost their jobs. Those who were engaged had to break off their engagements. Those who were married had to make a decision, Jesus or wife and children. Uh, those who were lifelong friends, friends of 30 and 40 years had to renounce their friendships. Those who were free, many of them were bound and thrown in jail. These new Christians, these new believers, Salem, they were suffering the worst hardship that you or I could ever imagine. When all of a sudden they get some good news. Let me hear you say good news. They get some good news. They get this letter, Melvin, they get, Hank, a letter 
from their elder brother, from the big brother, James. They get a letter from James. Everybody in the church knew James. All of them respected James. All of them looked up to James. And listen, Walter, listen to what advice James gives the new believers. For those who are suffering, for those who have hardships, for those who are going through trials, my brother, my brother, we, we family, we, we family. Come on, fam, come on, fam. Uh, my, my brother and my brother and count it all joy. When you go into diverse temptations. I know, you're, I know you're suffering. I know you've been kicked out the house. I know you, you get kicked out the wheel. I know you're having a hard time. But number one, here it is. James says, when you're having a hard time, next week I'm going to preach what to do when you don't know what to do. But let me stay on my script today. James says, when you're having a hard time, is there anybody here who might be a candidate for this sermon? When, when, when your back is against the wall, when you don't know what to do, when your friends are few, when you're going through stuff and you know it's not your fault, when you're going through something and you can't explain and can't even imagine how you got into the situation, James says, learn how to count. Turn to the person next to you and say, neighbor, you got to learn to count. I know you're going through. I know you got some ups and downs. I know you got some challenges. I know your heart is heavy. I know you barely made it into this room today. But I came by to tell you, learn how to count. Watch this. Do you know that the last thing I want to hear when I'm going through something the last thing I want to hear when my back is against the wall, the last thing I want to hear when the roof has caved in is for somebody to come along and tell me, be happy about what I'm going through. Do I have any real people here today? Can, can we be honest with each other? But James says, he says, he says, count it all, all. Oh, not, not some of the stuff we're going through. Count it all oh, joy. Watch this word. When we go through different things. Count it all joy when stuff stops. Now, I came by to tell you today, stuff going to happen. I wish I had a real church here today. I said stuff gonna happen. You, you just keep on living. Stuff is gonna happen. And stuff happens all the time. Every day. Every night. Up sometime. Down sometime. Feel good sometime. Feel bad sometime. Stuff happens. And I came to tell you, I don't want to be the one delivering bad news. Stuff gonna always happen. Huh? I said stuff is gonna always happen. According to Warren Worsby, who is a noted theologian, the book of James, the theme of this book is be mature. Let me give it another theme. Look at the person next to you and say, soldier, grow up. Don't be whining and talking about you got to get up early. Don't be whining and talking about you got ki kitchen patrol. Don't be whining and talking about you got to, I got to carry all this heavy stuff on my back. Grow up! James is trying, and I know, I know you all, I know, I hate hardships. I hate going through something. I hate, is there anybody here with me? I hate pain. I hate suffering. If I could design a life for myself, I would design a life for myself that never included any pain. But I came by to remind you of the old Proverbs that the Arabs had. It says, all sunshine makes a desert. In other words, you got to have some rain in your life. Let me go on. Let me go on. Learn how to count. James is trying to help Christians look at 
stuff. He's trying to help us embrace our suffering as we see it from another perspective. Huh? Learn to count. Be joyful, he says. Be all right. Be content when stuff happens. Be all right. Be all right. As a believer, when trials come, we know what trials are. Come on now. You come home and your 14-year-old daughter, stomach is sticking out. And you thought, you thought you were noticing something. She was putting on them big sweaters, you thought. But all of a sudden, tears in her eyes, she tells you, I'm pregnant. Somebody here, no trials. You go to work one day. And a security guard is standing at your desk. Watching you clean out your stuff. And as you find the box to put your stuff in, they are marching you down the hallway like a common thief. And now you have to go home and tell your family on, on the bus, because did I tell you they took the company car? And now you on the bus with a box of things having to tell oh, 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 about the bus because your Uber app, it was through the job. <laughs> it was through the job. You kept hitting it and wondering why it was through the job. And you were on the bus having to explain. You know trials, don't you? The people keep going up on your rent. Ain't nothing you can do about it but move. You, you, you know trials, don't you? Uh, Negroes making up stuff about you. Putting you in places that you don't even know where the place is. Saying stuff about you that you don't even have an idea. Who thinks of this stuff? Who come up with this stuff? And now all of a sudden, they, they got new stuff. New, they got a Facebook way of say, talking about you. You know trials, don't you? There's trouble in your family. You, you know trials, don't you? Not having enough money for nothing, never. You know trials, you know trials. Sickness in your body. Hair that used to be black can't even be dyed black. You at Walgreens arguing with the people. Ain't y'all got nothing darker? You know, you know, you know trials. One word, trials, one word, one one no, this one word means trials in your life. Relationship. That 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 whole mean try the whole thing mean drama the whole thing mean you know you know trials don't you Reverend Thurston says anybody in the congregation lose a loved one this week and you have to stand with tears in your eyes because you're burying another relative you know trials. And all that's bad. And, 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 and I really wish, I wish to God, I wish I could stop right there. And, and, and tell you that when Paul says, counting, I mean, when James says, I told you, Paul. I just, Paul, my go-to guy, when, uh, when James says, count it all joy, I wish I could tell you that that's all that trials mean. But it ain't. Because he's not only talking about trials that we go through without. He's also talking about the trials that we go through within. You, you, you know trials within? Temptation. 
He's talking about that too. He's talking, you, you know temptation, you know temptation. Stuff that you want to look at and, and know you ain't got no business looking at it. You know t temptation, stuff that you want to touch. I ain't got, you, you know temptation, people that you want to touch you. You know temptation, where you want to be touched, the way you want to be touched. You know temptation, stuff you want to drink, stuff you want to smoke, stuff you want to put in the vape pipe. Mm-hmm. Our battles, Salem, our struggles are not just the stuff that we face without. I believe that the worst struggle and the worst battles that we face are not those that we face that come from the outside, but the worst struggles that we have are the evil things that we want to do that we know that spiritually they're off limits. I can put up with the trouble that come from other people because I got somebody to blame. I can put up with being lied on and, and cheated and talked about and mistreated because that's something that somebody else is doing. But then I have all of my own issues that I have to fight 24-7 and then here comes James telling me to find a way to be happy about it. James, are you nuts with all of this temptation I'm dealing with, with all of this stuff that I want to do that I ain't got no business doing, and you telling me count it all joy? Count it all joy. I need a drink. Way I'm being pushed and pulled and worried, I need some Xanax. I need a joint. I need a pill. I need the whole bottle. Do I have a few more minutes? I ain't, I ain't been here in a while. I saved up some time. The Bears don't play till tonight. They don't play till tonight. Give me, give me 15 more minutes. Do I have it? The only way, watch this now. Let's move on. The only way we can count it joy, because that, that sounds crazy. And I'm telling you now, that sounds crazy. I'm going through pain, I'm going through tribulation, and James is telling me to count in joy. That, that sounds crazy, but the only way that can work is, is when you know something. Ask the person next to you, what do you know? What do you know? What do you know? The only way we can count in verse 2, James says, is based on what we know in verse 3. I wish I had a real church. Can I say it again? The only way you can count in verse 2 is based on what you know in verse 3. So let's go to verse 3. I'm only doing it for verses, so you know it can't be long. Verse 3, you ready to start with me? What's the first two words? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith does what? Worketh patience. Knowing this. You got to know something. If you're going to get through the stuff that keeps popping up from out of nowhere. You got to know something if you're going to deal with constant drama because if you don't know it, you'll think that Jesus doesn't love you. If you don't know it, you'll think that it's your sins that's coming up and causing this. You got to know something. It is what we know, James says, about trials that help us see our trials in a different light. All right, all right. I have to know that while I'm in basic training, 
that this same wall I see in basic training that I might see it one day in Iraq. Come on now. They, 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 they ain't just pushing me to get over that wall in a hurry. Talking about you got uh, 4.8 seconds, get over that wall. Uh, that that 4.8 second wall maneuver in basic training might come up in North Korea. Some fool get us in a war. Are you with me here? I have to know that that mud that I am crawling through in basic training for practice is the same mud I might see in the war zone. I have to know that while I'm in basic training, shooting at a stationary target that is getting me ready for a real uh, target that ain't going to be stationary, ain't going to be shooting back. Are, are you with me here? You see you all, let me, let, me, let me try to tip my hand. Let me try to tip my hand. God already knows what's ahead. God already knows what obstacles you getting ready to go through next week, next month, and next year. And God, as your drill sergeant, is obligated now to prepare you for what's going to come up next week. Holy is the Lamb. James says it is what we know about our trials that help us with the trial because God is not trying to break you. He's trying to make you. He's trying to get you ready to be a good soldier in the army of the Lord. And so since he knows what's up ahead, he knows what's in your future. And he knows that you ain't been through enough yet to face what you're going to have to face. Then he'll bring some trials. He'll bring some tribulation so that you can face it now. So that when you get to it on the other side of next year you'll say I've seen this before I know how this looks I know what this is all about he says he says he says look here now you got to know that it's the trying of your faith that worketh patience the trying of your what faith God's sole purpose, listen to this now, I'll let, you, I'll let you go. God's sole purpose is not your happiness. God's sole purpose is not whether you got a new car or not, whether your weave match the rest of your hair. Whether you graduate whether you're happy, that, that ain't God's sole purpose. God's sole purpose, now that you are a Christian, is that you mature in the faith. Huh? One day you're going to have to stand before God and God wants to know and he has to make sure that we got enough faith to make it to the finish line. Are you with me here? I hear, I hear, I hear Jesus saying to Peter, 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 uh, the devil has come and, and, and the devil has asked me to tempt you. The devil has asked me to try you. And, and he didn't say, and so I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you don't have to go through nothing. I'm praying that you don't have to go through tribulation. I'm praying. He said, no, that ain't what I'm praying for because I already decided that you're going through it. Because I need you on the day of Pentecost. I need you when I'm gone. You're the strongest one of them. I need you when I'm gone. So this is what I'm going to pray for. I'm going to pray that your faith fails not. God is in the faith strengthening business. God is working on your faith muscles. God is trying to increase our faith. God is trying to make sure that we got a little more faith this year than we had last year. That we got a little more faith this month than we had last month. It's all about faith. 
Oh, God, if I had a real church, I could be. You don't believe me? You don't believe me? It's all about faith. Come here, Hebrew writer. What you got to say about it? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please. How many of you want to please him? Is there anybody here that want to please him? Is there anybody here that want to please him? Well, I want to please him. Well, Meeks, if you want to please me, then you got to have faith. And I can't leave you with the same amount of faith that you had last year. So come here trouble. Come here obstacle. Come here pain. Come here sickness. I need you to pay a visit so I can make sure that this boy's faith fails not. Why I got to go through all this? Why I got to have this? Because God loves you. And God wants to mature you. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. So he's giving you a little more faith. Oh, God. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Now listen, Salem. I hate tribulation. I hate pain. I hate agony. And God knows I hate temptation. I hate it all. I hate to wake up and want to do something that I know is wrong. I hate it. But I came to tell somebody to know this morning that a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that you can't trust. God will test us to bring out the best in us. I know you don't want to hear it. I know it's going to sound strange, but trials work for us, not against us. Did you hear what I said? I'm going to give you a Bible in a minute. I said trials work for us. Let me hear you say trials work for us. You want some Bible to bag it up? For we know. That all things, all things got to include all things. The pain you're going through, the stuff you're going through, the difficulty in your life. All things are working. Are working for your. All things are working for my good. All things are working for my good. Trials work for us. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For, y'all got it up there yet? I, everybody got to see it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. One last time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Here we go. I know what it says. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, you read. Stop! Stop! Work it for us! Work it for us! It's only a moment, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us! So my son, my grandson, my grandson, James Trent the third is two years old. And uh, his mom and daddy decided to put him in daycare. And uh, got him all dressed up, gave him a little backpack. He was all excited, all happy. He didn't know where they were going. He didn't know what was going to happen. I guess he thought me, mama, and daddy going to school. They're going to sit there in school with me. They're going to stay there all day. We're going to have a good time. Got him to the school, he all happy. Wave goodbye, he freaked out. You know the drill, right? You know the drill, you've seen this before. Freaked out. And then he, 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 he's grabbing on his mama, won't let her go, they peel, peel the boy off his mama, peel the boy off his daddy, peel the boy off, teacher say go on. Now here this two year old is, in a place with strangers. 
not understanding what just happened. All he knows is the people that I've been with all my life just dropped me off with these strangers. And I have no clue of why they left me with these strangers. Now he's thinking that for the rest of his life, it's going to be him and them strangers. And that his mama and daddy are gone forever. The kid agonizes all day until 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, here comes mama, here comes daddy, kid's still crying. Ask the teacher what happened. The teacher said he just stood there, just cried. Just looked out the window. He just cried. He just agonized. He's happy. They take him back home. He says, all right. This, the kids say this drama is over. Next day. When they put the backpack on him, he said, no school. When they rode up to the building, no school, no school. They go back through the drill, the same drill happens again. Goes the third day, the fourth day, the drill happens again. But by the fifth day and by the next week, the kid has realized something. They dropped me off. But they ain't never left me. They coming back. Tribulation first come in the life of a believer. We fall out. Oh God, what's going to happen? I don't know how I'm going to make it. God shows up. Next tribulation come. We fall out again. You got to have a test. And now, oh God, I got to have a test. Then God shows up. Then the next thing that come along, God shows up. It finally dawns on us. There's never been a time in my life where the Lord has let me fall. There's never been a time in my life where the Lord did not answer my call. So I can understand this is only basic training. If the Lord showed up every other time, then the Lord is going to show up this time. So Paul closes, he say, now you got it. James says, then let patience work. Let it work. Paul said, I could give you one better than that. We glory in tribulation because we know that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. Touch somebody and say, neighbor. You've been through too much to be crying about what you're going through now. Same God. Same God. Same God who had your back last time is the same God who's got your back now. So relax. Chill out. Stop worrying about it. Same God who delivered you before. He got a track record. He comes back every day to see about you. He comes to see about me just when I need him most. Is there anybody here that's got that testimony that God always comes through? Is there anybody who knows that God always got your back? Then shake somebody's hand and say, well, it must be time for me to grow up. It must be time for me to grow up. Because when I grow up, God shows up. And when he shows up, he shows out. That's enough. God ain't mad at you. God ain't mad at you. God's not trying to hurt you. God ain't trying to break you. This is just basic training. God knows that you're going to see some stuff next week. He got to get you ready this week. 
And when you look into the eyes of that next demon that you're going to have to face, you're able to say, no, demon, get back. I done seen demons. I done seen bigger demons than you before. Stand on your feet, everybody. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, everybody, and all that is within me. Oh, God, that sounds so good. Come on, Salem, worship out your spirit. Lead. All over the building, come on. Let's love on God for a minute. He loves us. He loves us. Come on. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Say it from your spirit. Oh, 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 and all. Within me, we worship you, Master. We worship you. Please. Let's give him some props for all the things that he has done. Let's give him some props for it. He has done great things. Yes, you have, Lord. You deserve praise. You deserve thanksgiving. He. Yes, you have, Lord. He has done great things. Bless his hope. It's about eyes are closed. Our Father and our God, we thank you now for your word. We pray, God, that your word will sink deep. We pray that your word will remind us all week, all month, all year, that you're using our trials to strengthen our faith, that you're using our trials to teach us that you got our back, that you're using our trials to make us stronger because only you know what's ahead in our lives. And so, God, we're sorry for the times that we've doubted you and help us to be stronger even more in our faith. There are many people here today, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and you're not sure of your salvation. You're not sure that if you died tonight, you would go to heaven. I want to I help you today. I want to I help you today. If you're not 100% sure that you would go to heaven if you dropped dead today, Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm not to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to know who to pray for. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I see you all over the building. I see you. You may lower your hand. One way, there's only one way to know for sure that you're going to heaven. And that's to know for sure that Jesus lives in your heart. There's only one way to know for sure that Jesus lives in your heart. And that is to ask him to come in. The Bible says, he that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Those of you who raised your hand saying, Pastor, I'm not sure that I want to go to heaven. If you want to be sure, let me tell you how to be sure. Right now, you have to call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you raised your hand saying, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven, and you want to be sure, I want you to, if you believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead, I want you to repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for all of my sins. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I accept you right now as my Savior and as the Lord of my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you just prayed that prayer, you just asked Jesus to come into your heart. Slip your hand up again. Slip your hand up again. I see you. I see you, my sister, my sister, my brother. I see you. I see you all over the building. Holy is the Lamb. I see you. You may lower your hand. If anybody ever asks you, how do you know you're going to heaven? Tell them one Sunday, the second Sunday in September 2018, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Whoever calls on his name shall be saved. One more bit of business. If you're here and you're not a member of a church, maybe you used to go. Maybe you stopped going for some reason or another. Maybe you stopped going to church because people in church ain't no good. And that's true. Ain't none of us no good. But there's a God who is real good. 
And that's the only reason we come. We don't come for each other. We come because God is good and he's faithful. If you are not a member of a church, if you don't have a church that you could call home, will you raise your hand? Will you raise your hand? Come on, be honest. Nobody's looking for me. I see you. I see you all over the building. You may lower your hands. I want to pray for you, but I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to say, God, I need a church. I need a church where I could go. I need a church where I could grow. I need a church where I can understand when they open up the Bible. I need a church where I could be served in your service. God, we love you and we praise you and we lift you up. Again, we thank you for worship today and we thank you for your preached word. And we know that faith coming by hearing. I pray now for all of the people who are not members of a church. I thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for what you're getting ready to do in their lives. Do only what you can now. We've done our best. In Jesus' name, amen. Look this way. Those of you who are not members of a church in Salem, I know what time it is. Please don't start running, darting, and that this is the most important part of our service. Somebody's eternal life hangs in the balance right now. It could be the person you're sitting next to. It could be the person that you are near. I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, the members of the church are getting ready to sit down and pray and keep singing this song. Those of you who are not members of a church, we love you. We ain't here to judge you. We ain't here to criticize you. We ain't here to look at you funny. All of us sat where you're sitting. All of us made this decision. Today is your day. We're here to rejoice with you. I want to see you by the hundreds walk out of that aisle, come down to the front, and give God a chance to be number one in your life. You ready? When I count to three, the members are going to sit down. Don't you sit down. Come now from wherever you are. One, two, three. He has done great things. 